talk today is about TRIP steels, where TRIP stands for transformation induced plasticity. Well, one of the major reasons for the development of particular kinds of TRIP steels is, of course, the um, automobile. And here you see a section of a car door. Uh, the panel inside is really quite complicated. Uh, this is a, a bar which is incorporated for side impact resistance, and you can see the complexity of the shape here. <clears throat> and very often, parts of this panel are not made of identical steel. A sheet of material and a different sheet of material, which have been laser welded along here. And it's quite remarkable that after this is formed, you maintain the in integrity of the laser weld. So you're using stronger steels in some parts and thicker steels in other parts where corrosion might be an issue and so on. So this is rather like uh, making a, a, a dress. And that's why this is called a tailored blank. That means we've cut the pieces according to the requirements for the different parts of the panel. And of course, uh, this, for example, is uh, the panel that I was illustrating, the side of a uh, mini, mini car. Uh, but of course, this technology goes into all of the modern cars. Now, the big advantage of using uh, trip assisted steels is that compared with the conventional steel that used to be used in car bodies, uh, this has much greater strength and yet has sufficient formability in other words, uh, sufficient elongation in this case, but formability is a complicated thing to define. And uh, Professor Bala is going to give a talks on this. But as a very, very rough guide, you know, obviously, if you get elongation in tension, you're likely to get uh, some level of formability. So you can see that there is quite a remarkable difference in strength and maintaining the ductility. And that means that you can actually use less steel compared with this. And that makes a car lighter than it used to be. OK, so um, the main aspect of transformation induced plasticity is that there is a shape deformation that accompanies uh, the formation of martensite from austenite. And if this square represents my austenite, then as a consequence of transformation into martensite, you would get a deformation which looks like this, uh, where there is a shear of the order of 0 0.26 and a volume expansion normal to the plate of the martensite of 0 0.03. <clears throat> and here, of course, I've drawn a unit square here. So these are unit vectors. And I've illustrated the shape deformation uh, before, but you can see it here. This is austenite, fully austenitic sample, transforming into plates of martensite. So these are physical deformations, which you can see with your own eyes. And those deformations have an influence on the ductility of the steel. Uh, because these martensitic transformations are triggered inside the steel when you actually stretch it or deform it. Okay. So if I represent the deformation of this initial cube uh, by unit vectors Z1 and Z3, uh, then the whole of this deformation can be represented by this deformation matrix, where the first column here represents the components of a vector parallel to the x-axis after the deformation. So if this is Z1, which has a length 1, then obviously it, change, it is not changed by this deformation. Therefore, it remains as 1, 0, 0. Similarly, the y-axis, which is poking out of the plane of the diagram, doesn't change in length as a consequence of this deformation because it lies in this invariant plane. So it's 0, 1, 0. However, this axis here is altered because it acquires a component s along the x-axis and a component psi uh, zeta along these z-axis. So after deformation, this becomes a vector equivalent here 
to S0, 1 plus theta. Okay? And the importance of this deformation matrix is that I now can completely define what happens to any vector as a consequence of the shape change of transformation. So, for example, if we have an initial vector u here, uh, then as a consequence of the shape deformation of Martin side, it is changed into a vector v, which is pointing in a different direction and also has an increase or decrease in length. If I represent the vector u as a column vector here, u, v, w, and then I multiply this matrix by a column, then I get the vector v. So let's assume that u is a vector 1, 0, 1 of the austenite. Then because of the deformation, if I multiply this matrix by a column vector, which is 1, 0, 1, then I would end up with a new vector, 1 plus s, 0, and 1 plus zeta. And if I put in the numbers for s and zeta, then 1, 0, 1 becomes a vector 1.26, 0, 1.03. And obviously, it points in a different direction and has a different magnitude. And the ratio of the magnitudes uh, is 0 0.14. In other words, this has been elongated by 14% as a consequence of the Martin Siddiq transformation. Okay? So this deformation matrix is very simple to define, and it helps to calculate uh, what happens to any vector as a consequence of the deformation. Now, obviously, um, a trip steel is austenitic at room temperature, uh, and it's the deformation which causes it to transform into martensite. So we need to have some theory to treat that problem. And we know that martensite is triggered when the difference in the free energy of the austenite and the martensite becomes equal to this critical value here, delta G gamma to alpha, and that defines the martensite start temperature. So this is during cooling below the Tiso temperature. Uh, nothing will happen until you get to a critical driving force delta G gamma to alpha, and then Martin site is triggered. And that helps you to define the Martin site start temperature in terms of thermodynamics. So I've emphasized to you that uh, Martin site is both a phase transformation and a physical deformation, and therefore it will respond to any applied stress. There will be a mechanical interaction between the strain of transformation and the stress. And that will cause a change in the free energy of the uh, free energy difference between austenite and martensite. So this is delta G gamma to alpha as a function of temperature for zero applied stress. Okay. And this uh, sorry, this is the curve for zero. This is the curve for Martin site uh, to be triggered at the MS temperature when a critical value of delta G gamma to alpha is reached. And if I also have an applied stress at, uh, which fails Martin Siddiq transformation, then there is this term here, which is the mechanical interaction between the stress and the shape deformation, which effectively adds to the free energy of transformation, and therefore our Martin size start temperature increases to a value ms sigma. Okay? So even if our material is in an austenitic condition here because it's above the ms temperature, the application of a stress can trigger a Martin Siddiq transformation. And it's very easy to show this. So this is an experiment uh, that I did a long time ago, and many others have done the same. Uh, where I have an alloy, heavily alloyed with nickel, so it's fully austenitic, even at minus 44 degrees centigrade. And then when I make a, a tensile specimen, which is shaped like this, so that there is a stress gradient along here, the stress being smallest here and greatest here, and then I break this specimen, and I can measure the volume fraction of martensite at every single point on this uh, specimen, and plot a graph like this. So this clearly shows that the amount of martensite I generate in my specimen uh, is a function 
of the applied stress, a linear function of that applied stress. Okay, so the greater the stress up to a limit, uh, the greater the tendency for martensite to form. But there is another effect as well. Uh, typically inside an austenite grain, there are 24 orientations of martensite, but not all of them will interact favorably with an applied stress. And therefore, when transformation happens under the influence of stress, we actually get a non-random microstructure generated. So I'm going to show you an optical micrograph from approximately this region of the tensile specimen. And the applied stress is along this direction. And you can see that these plates are tending to align at approximately 45 degrees to the tensile axis because those variants have the most favorable interaction with the stress. In other words, they are causing elongation in the direction of the stress. Now, this is a polycrystalline uh, sample, and yet we have this strong alignment of the martensite plates. It's a non-random microstructure. So we need to work out the value of the mechanical free energy contributed by the applied tensile stress. And of course, the plates are oriented in different directions, so their inter interactions with the applied stress will be different. Just as when you do an experiment on slip, you know, only those slip systems which are maximally stressed will operate first. So this is a, a Mohr circle where we are plotting here the normal stress and the shear stress. And theta here is the angle between the tensile axis, which is indicated by the arrow, and the habit plane theta of the martensite plate. Uh, now on the Mohr circle, the angle theta is represented as 2 theta, and we can work out the shear stress on the habit plane as this height over here, which is simply equal to sigma 1 upon 2, because that's the radius of this circle, yeah, times sine of 2 theta. Sine is the, this component here. Okay. So this is the shear stress resolved on the habit plane of martensite. The normal stress is this total distance up to this point, okay? So this part is simply sigma one upon two, okay? That's our applied stress divided by two. And this part is resolved onto this direction. So it's cos two theta here, sigma one upon two times cos theta. So the normal stress acting in this direction is sigma one upon two times one plus cos two theta. And the shear stress interacts with the shear strain of martensite, and the normal stress interacts with the dilatational strain of martensite. So we can write the mechanical interaction energy, U, as the shear stress here, multiplied by the shear strain of transformation, and the normal stress multiplied by the dilatational strain. And we want to find the optimum angle theta which gives us the maximum interaction with the applied stress. So if I differentiate this mechanical energy, interaction energy with respect to the angle theta, I get this and I set that to zero. Then you find that the maximum interaction occurs when tangent of two theta is equal to S over psi, where psi uh, zeta, where zeta is the dilatational strain. Now, obviously, um, uh, theta is not free to vary because the habit plane has certain crystallographic indices, but there are 24 of these in a particular austenite grain, so it's possible to find something that is close to theta max. Okay. So we go back to our deformation matrix, which we defined earlier, where the columns here represent what happens to these unit vectors as a consequence of this deformation. And we set our initial vector u parallel to the tensile axis, uh, making some sort of uh, an angle theta max, uh, which is 41.7 degrees from the tan two theta equals s over zeta. Okay, sine theta max and cos theta max and zero. And as a consequence of 
the deformation associated with the transformation, if I multiply this matrix by a column vector, which is u, then I get the resultant vector, which is this. And I can work out the magnitude of the elongation due to the transformation happening at the optimum orientation, and that comes to 15% of elongation. That means if you have a fully austenitic sample and all the martensite that forms in it is exactly along theta max, then you would get 15% elongation simply from the shape deformation of martensite. Okay, nothing else. You're not causing you know, dislocation flow in, like in ordinary plasticity, but simply from the shape deformation of martensite. But I emphasize that that is for the case where you have a fully austenitic specimen and that all the martensite forms in the optimum orientation. Now, in trip assisted steels of the type I illustrated for the car, we typically have less than 20% of austenite, okay, retained austenite. I'll explain why later. So I have to scale this number by 20%. Uh, so if I take 0.15 multiplied by 0.2, then the total elongation I would get from martensite forming from this retained austenite by an applied stress would be only 3% if all the variants formed in the optimum orientation. So this is really quite surprising, okay? That actually the transformation strain is not contributing very much at all to the total elongation of a trip-assisted steel. And that's why I wrote a paper called Trip-Assisted Steels with a question mark, because this number is an optimistic number, assuming that all martensite plates form in the most favorable orientation. And the elongation of these strip assisted steels is quite large. You know, it's of the order of uh, 25%. So the 3% makes a minor contribution to the total elongation. Uh, now, what then is the real reason why trip assisted steels uh, perform better? Well, Total elongation is defined by a plastic instability occurring somewhere where a neck develops on the tensile specimen and then it becomes narrower and narrower and you get fracture. Okay, And that plastic instability happens because the local reduction in the cross-sectional area of the tensile specimen cannot tolerate the resulting increase in stress when the sample has a constant load. Uh, it has to work harden at a greater rate than the increase in stress due to the decrease in the cross-sectional area if it is to continue deforming uniformly. Okay, So the clue is that we must also enhance the work hardening rate if we want more elongation. And of course, the formation of martensite, which is relatively hard, effectively work hardens your material. And that is the reason why trip assisted steels have such a large elongation, even though the contribution from the transformation plasticity itself is small. So I'll illustrate this. Uh, here is a tensile specimen uh, with the engineering and true stresses plotted which initially contained about 14% of uh, retained austenite. And you can see a beautiful curve here where we have a, a high work hardening rate initially and then a steady work hardening rate. Uh, and then you have fracture when the retained austenite content decreases to about 7%. Okay. Now, how can I prove that the transformation of the austenite is actually contributing to the elongation? Well, I've got to stop the transformation. And I can do that by do, repeating this test at 100 degrees centigrade. 100 degrees centigrade doesn't change the microstructure at all. But what it does is it increases the stability of the austenite. Okay? So I'm going to show you another graph which is plotted on exactly the same scale for the tensile test done at 100 degrees centigrade. And you can see that the elongation has dramatically decreased because the austenite is not transforming. Initial quantity 14.3 and final quantity 13% in the vicinity of the fracture. 
Okay. So there is absolutely no doubt that the transformation is playing a role and it is playing a role in increasing the work hardening rate of the material and therefore retarding the onset of plastic instability. Uh, there, there was a, a really nice uh, set of movies published recently, uh, a few years ago, by uh, Professor Suji from uh, Japan. And uh, he kindly gave me these movies. And this time we are testing a completely austenitic stainless steel. And uh, we've got uh, dots on our sample for digital image correlation. Okay, So the first test on this austenitic stainless steel uh, is done at ambient temperature and you see uh, what happens as we pull the sample. Okay, So we've got uniform deformation actually continuing along the gauge length of the specimen as the steel undergoes phase transformation which provides the work hardening that's necessary to avoid plastic instability. And then, of course, uh, eventually you get failure when we exhaust the contribution of transformation. Now, if we repeat exactly the same test at 200 degrees centigrade, so the austenite is more stable and therefore it will not transform under stress. So what we are looking at is strain maps in these colors obtained from the digital image correlation. And look, fairly quickly, you get localization of strain and eventually fracture. Okay. So by increasing the stability of austenite, you actually decrease the elongation, the uniform elongation quite dramatically. Now, so far I've talked uh, uh, about austenitic steels, which are fully austenitic at ambient temperature. But those kinds of steels are far too expensive for general application. Okay, So how do we produce cheap austenite? Well, we use carbon as an alloying element. But the dilemma is that you can't use too much carbon because these uh, formable steels have to be joined by welding. And you do not want uh, hard, brittle martensite forming in the heat affected zone, for example, of the spot wells. So how do we produce cheap austenite at a reasonably low average carbon concentration in the steel? Well, we've already learned in previous lectures that when bainite forms, it partitions carbon. Uh, and we can stop the reaction here okay, by adding silicon of a steel. So we end up with a mixture of bainitic ferrite and carbon enriched retained austenite, even though the average carbon concentration in our steel is as low as 0.1 weight percent. Okay, So this is the mechanism by which the trip assisted steels, which are used in automotive applications, are produced. Now, for automotive applications, Having a 100% bainitic microstructure is not terribly uh, good for the sort of applications that I showed you early in the lecture. That means car body panels and so on. So we have to have a mixture of allotriomorphic ferrite, a large quantity of allotriomorphic ferrite, and some of the bainite and retained austenite. And the normal way of producing this is you either take a cold roll steel and you heat it up into an intercritical region. OK, so you get recrystallization of the ferrite and you get new austenite generated and then you cool into the bainite transformation range for this austenite to transform into bainite. And there may be a little bit of martensite forming during the further cooling. And the second way is uh, that you start with a fully austenitic structure. You cool so that you generate some allotriomorphic ferrite and then you hold it in the bainite transformation region and get the same sort of microstructure, which uh, looks looks like this. Okay, So this is an image that Pascal Jacques uh, from the um, uh, Louvain University in Belgium gave me, uh, where we have about 70 percent 
of allotromorphic ferrite. And then we have this retained austenite and bainite in between because of the carbon partitioning, both when the ferrite forms and when the bainite forms. Okay? And notice that the average carbon concentration is just 0.158% of carbon. And of course, we have the silicon here to prevent cementite precipitation. So the typical microstructure is 70% allotromorphic ferrite, 16% bainitic ferrite, and 14% of retained austenite. And with a fully austenitic specimen, we expect an elongation of the order of 15%, but we have to multiply that by the volume fraction of retained austenite. So the elongation that we expect just from the shape deformation is just too small, too small to explain the properties of this, the really good properties of this uh, steel. Uh, but I've already demonstrated to you that it is the work hardening capacity that helps to achieve the 25% elongation. So here you can see that the work hardening rate is much greater than in ordinary um, uh, steel that used to be used for making automobiles. It's the work hardening capacity that rules, okay? Okay, so we produced a cheap steel where we are using carbon that is um, uh, stabilizing the austenite that we need to provide the work hardening as we deform the material and therefore to delay plastic instability and achieve a high elongation. So elongation of crip assisted steel is not due to transformation plasticity or not, and uh, you know, it's a minor contribution, but because of work hardening due to the formation of hard martensite. And that is the underlying principle of trip assisted steels. Now, we've used uh, uh, quite a lot, uh, an unusually large amount of silicon in our steel, and there are some problems associated with that. Now, rusting is a process in which you generate iron ions and hydroxyl ions from oxygen and the iron, and they combine to form this compound, which doesn't form on the surface here, but in the fluid in front of the surface. And that is why it doesn't protect your steel. And it looks ugly, okay? So this is my bicycle, which I have done something like 60,000 miles on for commuting to work, all right? So it's a heavy bike and, uh, uh, you know, there's nothing sexy about this bicycle. And in this case, an ugly look helps very much because Cambridge is a place where in the UK it is the highest record of bicycles being stolen. And this bicycle hasn't been stolen for about 25 years, okay? So, Rust generally, we think, is ugly and uh, we do not want it, especially if, uh, you know, um, our car body panels are thin. There is another form of rust, uh, which is uh, beautiful, actually. So this is a picture that I took um, in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains, uh, where you can see these fences here, and there are miles and miles of fences have a beautiful color which matches the surroundings. You know, it's a wooden color. And that actually is rust. But this time, the rust adheres to the surface because of the particular chemistry here. You can find a video on my website explaining the mechanism by which it stays on there. Okay. However, silicon poses a particular problem. Okay, so look, look at this. There are patches of red rust on our steel sheet, and that is totally unacceptable for outward facing car panels. And the reason for this is that we have our steel, and because of the presence of silicon, we form something known as phaolite here which during hot rolling actually is molten and it penetrates the surface of the steel and provides a mechanical key with the surface. And on top of that, we have iron oxide, Fe304 and Fe203, which is the red color. Now, normally uh, during hot rolling, you would blast off the scale, right? You're using water jets or, or other methods. But because of this mechanical key, it's very difficult to 
get rid of phaolite. This is called phaolite, Fe2SiO4. And that is left together with some iron oxide, which then you know, oxidizes to these uh, unacceptable um, cosmetic appearance. So we wanted to design a steel which has a low silicon concentration and yet has a certain amount of retained austenite. And because of the large amount of research that has been done on trip assisted steels, there were a lot of experimental data in the literature. And we use machine learning to analyze those data. And I'm going to very briefly explain to you machine learning. So machine learning is a way of creating a complicated mathematical function. OK, so that uh, your complex data can be represented by that function. And here, this is a, uh, actually a very simple machine learning algorithm where we have four hyperbolic tangents and two variables. But in fact, you can have any number of uh, hyperbolic tangents and any number of variables. But the point is that these are very flexible functions. OK, so just by altering these weights, I can change the mathematical form of this surface and make it sing and dance. And that means it can tackle any problem of any complexity in principle. OK, so we did this. We collected a large amount of data uh, from the literature on trip assisted steels. And created a machine learning model. But there is one problem, okay, that machine learning faces, and that is, I, you know, supposing I have these experimental data, is this the correct representation of those data, or is this the correct representation? And human intuition would go for for this, right? Uh, you know, go for the simpler function, but that isn't really justified. Uh, it could very well be this function. Okay, in spite of the noise in our data. So how do we solve this problem? Well, what you do is you take all your data and randomly divide it into two halves. Right? So the open points and the closed points. So we call the open points the test data, and these are the training data. So these black dots are the only ones you use in creating the model. And then you expose the model to unseen data to see how it behaves. Now. In this case, the linear function is obviously too simple. OK, it, it doesn't represent either your training data or the test data adequately. This function here is too complicated. Right? Uh, it, it doesn't generalize well into unseen data. You can see large errors here. And really, we want to work in a domain where we are beyond the experimental data because we don't just want to repeat science. We want to create something new. And here is a function which behaves nicely both on the unseen data and the training data. So if I plot the training and test errors as a function of the complexity of the model, then the training error continues to go down as my model becomes more complex because you have modeling noise uh, when you make your model too complex. Whereas the test error goes through a minimum when you reach the optimum complexity. So that is how uh, you work out what is the optimum level of machine learning that we should use, and no more than that. So here are the variables, which are the inputs, and the last one is an output. Okay, And we want to limit the amount of silicon, and this is the intercritical annealing temperature and the isothermal transformation temperature and time. Uh, so we've got the heat treatment, we've got the chemical composition, and the output should be our retained austenite. And we got uh, a very surprising outcome from the machine learning that it tells us that, OK, we'll go for a low silicon, but I want a high carbon concentration, all right? So you immediately start worrying about this from the point of view of welding. Uh, and there's a high aluminum concentration. It's, it's well known that uh, aluminum also retards cementite, OK? And it gives me the heat treatment parameters and an error bar on the amount of retained austenite that I should get. So it's very important that we have a large error bar because that means we are working in a domain which hasn't been explored before. Okay. If you get a small error bar, that means somebody has done the work before. So it's a very nice method 
to decide in a complicated problem whether you are actually doing something new. Now, there is a, a, an effect of aluminium which is beyond that of controlling the cement dye precipitation. If I look at the iron aluminium phase diagram here, then as I increase the aluminium concentration, we begin to lose the possibility of austenite. So this is the austenite plus ferrite phase field, austenite, and uh, delta and alpha are exactly the same uh, crystal structure. Delta is simply the forms at high temperatures and alpha at low temperatures. But in this case, after solidifying to delta beyond a certain aluminum concentration, you would just end up with a ferritic structure. You would never actually get any austenite at all in this steel. Okay. So when we made uh, made um, this material here, uh, we had a really quite odd microstructure. So uh, these shapes represent uh, dendritic shapes, and these are dendrites of um, delta ferrite, which doesn't transform at all during cooling, and you, we get very uh, uh, we get about half the region forming austenite because it's in the delta plus gamma phase field. Uh, and we can then do a heat treatment so that instead of getting martensite as in this picture, we get bainite, so we get austenite retained here. So it doesn't matter if it looks like a bizarre microstructure, uh, unconventional, as long as we have lots of uh, ferrite and we have a mixture of bainite and austenite, it's fine. So we call this the delta trip steel, okay? And a lot of work has been done on this. And you can see these are your normal automotive steels. And you know you shouldn't really be plotting this as banana plots with ellipses or squares. All these data are available on my website. So you can download an Excel spreadsheet because you know steels don't behave as if all the strength and ductility is confined to an ellipse or a square. We should actually use the data that are available. And these are results for a variety of heat treatments of the delta trip steel. And you may well ask, what are these? You know, because they seem to be performing extremely well. Well, these are the TWIP steels. That means twinning induced plasticity steels, which contain uh, something of the order of 25% of manganese, which I will talk about in the next lecture. But they are certainly not low alloy steels. All right? These are low alloy steels. So just by using a combination of machine learning and other factors, uh, we've obtained a trip steel, uh, which is strong and has considerable elongation. And this is my uh, colleague, uh, Hong Liang Yi, who is at Northeastern University, but has strong contacts with industry. And they made it on a larger scale. So this is after, after hot rolling, and this is after cold rolling, and after continuous annealing to produce the actual structure that I illustrated earlier. So we can get around the problem of silicon if, if the desire is there.